Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Classrooms as Catalysts, Producing Supply Chain Innovation. This is a webinar for transforming supply chain education. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Paul Cotter. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Stukent, and I'm so thrilled to be hosting this event with you today. As we begin, and as always, I want to encourage you to use the chat feature. Go ahead and start by sharing where you're from, which school you teach at, any information like that. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Our amazing team is standing by in real time to answer your questions throughout today's event. So the first thing I want to do is I want to launch a poll and I want to find out who's with us today. So go ahead and respond to this poll that's popping up on your screen right now. Are you a professor of supply chain management? Are you a supply chain practitioner? Are you a professor of another subject? Or are you involved in another industry? Let us know. We'd love to see who's with us today. All right. Also, if you cannot stick around for all of today's sessions, don't worry. We plan to share the recording with all attendees along with any links and resources that we shared throughout today's event. At the end, we will have a live question and answer session. As always, when you're chatting and participating with us today, please be respectful and polite when commenting. At Stukent, our mission is to help you, help your students, help the world. And as a special gift for you today, we want to offer you free instructor access and a free walkthrough of each of Stukent's supply chain courseware and simulations. That includes Principles of Supply Chain Management by Danica Porter, Logistics and Transportation by Vicki Clark and Brad Gatlin, and finally, Advanced Supply Chain by Nate Stemple. With a walkthrough, you'll be able to preview the entire courseware or simulation, including lesson plans, assignments, lecture slides, expert sessions, and so much more. So go ahead and click on the link right now for your free instructor access. Today's session is led by Nate Stemple, and he'll be joined later for a founder's conversation with Manuela Zonensign. What I want to do right now is introduce you to Nate while we invite him on stage. Nate Stemple is a seasoned consultant and entrepreneur. He has taught as an instructor in the US Navy Nuclear Propulsion Training Program and as a NROTC instructor at MIT. He has a master's of engineering in supply chain management and logistics from MIT, a master's of engineering and management from Old Dominion University, a bachelor's of engin electrical engineering from Auburn University, and a bachelor's in human resource management from the New School University. Welcome, Nate. Hi, thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Nate, it looks like you like to do things in pairs with your degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always good to have, uh, have company. Two, yeah. two is the best. Well, we want to welcome you and we want to thank you for joining us and being with us today. We're excited for today's event and I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you. I'm going to hop off stage and let you take control. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I have a, a quick presentation. It's going to be about 30 minutes, and then we are going to shift over to an awesome conversation I'm very excited about with Manuela. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I will get started. Uh, classrooms as Catalyst, Producing Supply Chain Innovation. Uh, this is the topic of the, of the course. I'm very passionate about innovation and supply chain. And so when I put together this course where this is one of my favorite chapters, and so I wanted to really dive deep into some of the concepts and some of the content about supply chain innovation, and then specifically, how, how do those concepts translate to students being successful once they reach industry? 
So the results of the poll, I will uh, share here. We have 25% professors of supply chain is the, is the lead and then uh, other is the second leading category or other is the leading category, professor of supply chain second, and then a couple um, additional ones from some other folks. So excited to see you all here. Please contribute to the dialogue. Uh, feel free to put questions in chat and um, it will be an interesting event if you all participate as we go, go through this. So the, the topics that I wanna cover, it's gonna be a lot, we're gonna go through it quick, uh, but hopefully it's gonna be engaging and super interesting. I'll start with the, the foundation of building a strategic supply chain. And that's kind of the, what the course where is, is built on. All of the chapters revolve around this. Then we're gonna dive into supply chain management, innovation, and end with a case study of implementation of some of the new uh, 5G shipment tracker technologies, and then shift over to that conversation, uh, like I mentioned. So starting with building a supply chain strategy. I take a top-down approach to understand how the supply chain strategy fits within the enterprise strategy, which fits within the industry dynamics. And so if you're going to succeed as a company, you need to know the environment that you play in, and that's the industry dynamics. Then once you understand your environment, you have to decide how are you going to compete within that environment, and then you need to use your supply chain to generate some strategic competitive advantage from your supply chain organization. And throughout the course, I use this framework in every single chapter. So you can uh, understand exactly how would you then, how would you in practice develop a strategic supply chain? So understanding the industry, this is taken from uh, Porter's five courses. And so there's an overview of threat of new entrants, bargaining power of suppliers, uh, threat of substitutes, bargaining power of buyers, and industry rivalry. So once you understand all of that, right, you have to create your unique competitive advantage. And we have four different options that you can choose one or more of these to stand out, to be the best at within your industry, which customers to serve, what quality to achieve, how to serve customers, and then how to build a defense or a moat around your market share. And then once you understand your your competitive strategy, how does your supply chain really help you and, and bolster that strategy? And your supply chain should be a strategic asset for your organization and not just a, a necessary function so that you can get your parts to your warehouse and your product made and delivered to your customer. I specifically have these 10 supply chain design characteristics. And this is what I've used throughout the course to guide uh, the strategic thinking of how a supply chain operates. Agility, that's the ability to rapidly change your actual supply chain. If you add, have to add a function, add a supplier, um, pivot your product, that is, that is an agile thing to do. Uh, control is you know, up the supply chain or down the supply chain. Can you influence the other partners in your network? And, and those things are done through you know, contracting methods, relationships, uh, location, if they're close proximity to you, all of those things go into how you can control the supply chain. Efficiency is about uh, you know, optimi optimization, cost, you know, driving out costs, uh, and flexibility, uh, similar to agility, but it's on, it's on the operational level. So can you scale up and down your orders? Can you uh, change not the supply chain network, but the dynamics of what you have already built, and that's the flexibility. Your quality, you know, kind of goes without saying, but you know, what is your your customer service level? How how what's your error level? What what are your um, defect rates? Those are all quality. And then predictability, right? How 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 good are your forecasts? Do you know what's going to happen? Um, where where is your your insights into how your supply chain is going to behave? And then reliability is. How how often are you hitting your targets? Uh, are you are you reliable and have you created systems and policies in place to, to improve reliability? Resiliency is you know your ability to withstand disruptions, and then speed of the supply chain is uh, you know from order to fulfillment. How long does that take? And is that something that you're concerned about? Should you be worried about 
about speed as a, as a supply chain attribute. And then velocity is, you know, that, that rate of product moving through your system and, um, you know, solving for a really quick and optimal manufacturing process. So I want to make that uh, a little bit more actionable and just discuss this at a, a supply chain level. So I'll use clothing industry as, as an example here. Typically, you know, you outsource textiles to, you know, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh. They get on a shipping container. There's a three month lead time for them to, to show up at your, your retailer, your warehouse, or if you're doing the manufacturing yourself. Uh, the, the clothing industry or the fashion industry, uh, there's a lot of fads. There's a lot of um, un, un, uh, uncertainty in what the consumer is actually going to buy. And you're trying to predict that ahead of time with this potentially quarterly or semi-annual uh, lead time. And what that results in is potentially a lot of excess stock that gets written off or, um, or destroyed. In, in 2017, I like to use the example Burberry. A, a British fashion, luxury fashion brand actually had to write off $36.9 million in excess product that they couldn't sell. And as a fashion brand, they don't send product to outlets to preserve their, their brand integrity. They don't want to dilute the brand. And so it actually just destroyed you know, $36 million worth of product. And uh, obviously that is a huge sustainability issue as well as a financial issue. And they got a lot of blowback from that. And so I use the example of Zara to, to then showcase, okay, so what's, what's a strategic supply chain network? Let's add strategy to the end of this. Zara is a fast fashion brand. It kind of compete, it's a Spanish company, competes in the middle of the market. So their you know, jackets are $200, they're not $600, they're not $50. Um, but they are in a very fragmented competitive fashion industry. And so what they do to stand out, their competitive advantage, their strategy is be the world's most responsive brand to shifting fashion trends. And so that really speaks to uh, competing in how they serve customers. And so in order for them to do that, they have to build a strategic supply chain that meets that strategy. And so highlighting here two different attributes, flexibility, um, specifically Zara has delayed postponement of a lot of their fabrics. So they will get a uh, plain fabric that's not dyed and they have the dyeing capabilities directly on site next to their manufacturing facilities that then produce their own goods to get to market. So that three month lead time that you typically see in the fashion industry or a clothing industry can be done in a matter of days or weeks for Zara because of how they design their supply chain to be, to be flexible to what the needs of the, of the consumer is. The other thing that they've done is focus on predictability. Like I said, in, in the clothing industry, fashion trends can swing dramatically and, and they've shortened that lead time to production, which means you know, their forecasting is also a much smaller lead time, which reduces the error. And they have uh, you know, stories literally of you know, someone out on a motorcycle taking a picture of a coat they've never seen before, sending it to production, getting designs and manufactured and then put out so they can meet these like new trends very, very rapidly. And so the shortening and the scanning of the environment increases their predictability. And obviously in supply chain, everything comes at a cost. It's a little bit higher uh, cost to operate that way, but it meets their strategy, be the world's most responsive brand to shifting fashion trends. So those are some good, that's, that's kind of uh, encompasses the overall framework that I use throughout all of the chapters to describe all of like supply chain, sourcing, procurement, conversion, logistics, it's all built around what is your environment? What is the industry you, you compete in? How have you created a strategic advantage? And then what do you specifically design within your supply chain to meet that advantage? So with that, I'll transition to uh, the innovation mandate, <laughs> I'll call it. Uh, how, so you've picked your strategic advantage, you, you're competitive in your industry, how do you remain competitive? Uh, innovation has a, has a lot to do with that. So showcasing you know, three examples here on the right, uh, Xerox is, got bought out by Fujifilm, 
huge successful company in the office printer industry. Everything has gone digital. Everything is done with DocuSign. Everything is done with email. There are no more faxes. There's some faxes. There's very few faxes anymore. And so um, Xerox did not pivot with the, the shifting trends. And so they, they lacked innovation to stay relevant. And now they're a subsidiary to Fujifilm. We see it with, with Polaroid, um, very famous example. They're, they were disrupted and, and unable to go digital with the digital photography. Uh, also a very interesting example, Kodak, uh, interestingly enough in 1975 actually invented the first digital camera, but they failed to innovate on their business model and they also ended up going bankrupt because of the way that they, did, they didn't appropriately shift with the trends, even though they invented the technology. And I think most people are familiar with Brock, Blockbuster, uh, a very classic failure case where their, their business relied on uh, um, late fees and they were not able to pivot even though they saw Netflix coming and ended up going out of business. And so I have here a more recent quote. Um, this comes out of a Boston Consulting Group study uh, innovation is now a top priority for close to 80% of the companies they surveyed. And so folks really understand this now. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of innovation and want to uh, emphasize that throughout the course and prepare students to go into you know, a, a highly um, dynamic environment. And that's, that is what innovation is. So uh, innovation impacts supply chain management directly. I have here um, seven top innovations that we're seeing in the supply chain industry as according to Microsoft Dynamics. And I'm gonna launch the poll here and I wanna get your take. What innovations are you most interested in? Uh, I have using robotics to work faster and driving efficiencies for automation as, as one. And uh, number three, I also have you know, collect data and the simplified compostable IT systems combined. because so I was limited to, to five different options in these surveys, but uh, I wanna hear your feedback and, and see what you're most excited about in supply chain. Uh, and, while, and while you're going through that, some, some of these maybe just bear some additional com conversation. Uh, the building the simplified composable IT system, I wanna highlight that one. I think most of these other ones are, are pretty self-explanatory. That one's kind of a little bit um, niche, but you're seeing industries buy unique supply chain softwares rather than let me get um, you know, the, the giant Oracle CRM, but it's, I want, I want a product management, I want an inventory management, and I want a um, you know, CRM that's going to be unique for my capabilities and then build their own uh, optimized IT system. And so that's the composable IT systems. All right, great. Looks like we have a clear winner, AI-driven decisions via advanced analytics. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna remember that and we're gonna dig into at least one startup doing some of that later on in the conversation. So where does innovation come from? Uh, I wanna talk about, I talk about four different sources of innovation, government, academia, startups, and established enterprises. And we're gonna, we're gonna walk through each of these four here in a little bit more detail. Uh, it sounds like an oxymoron, but government agencies actually do drive a lot of innovation and they support a lot of R&D um, throughout, throughout, the, throughout the world. And uh, specifically within the US, we have you know, the, the SBIR program, the, the Small Business Innovation Research Grants, uh, they're, they're funding over $3 billion a year in innovation research, and it's awarded to over 5,000 early stage innovations at for-profit companies. And so this is a great example of governments providing real incentives and real mechanisms to create innovations. I want to highlight at, at a macro level, look at a couple of different countries. And when you look at OEC data, OECD data, and World Bank data, you can see percentage of GDP spend on R&D, and, and it translates its influence on how efficient an economy is. And I use GDP per capita here to kind of show, are you creating more value from your economy per person? 
and R and D I think has a lot to do with that. So Canada has a, a pretty decent R and D budget. We we saw some some growth in the early 2000s, but it's kind of stagnant. I have Turkey here, who has a, a limited R and D budget, and you can see their GDP per capita uh, also pretty stagnant. South Korea, on the other hand, aggressively investing more and more money in R&D. And you can see their economy becoming more and more efficient and, and more and more technologically enabled. And so you're seeing the GDP per capita of South Korea, Korea go up. And then lastly, uh, Israel is the other key example here, has always had a very aggressive R&D spend from the government, ramping up here in the, in the last couple of years. And so you can see the return on investment that that gets for the government in their very, very steep slope increase in GDP per capita. So when you overlay all those together, you kind of get a really cool view that, you know, government spending on R&D really does impact the economy and it impacts companies. And so these are some things that, that you can kind of look at at a macro level to understand uh, what, are, what are some of the ways we can influence how, the, how companies are performing in the innovation space. And so quickly, here are four kind of big examples. Uh, we've got uh, clean energy investment. This is global. Uh, we have the governments across the country between 2022 and 2023 contributed $1.3 trillion to clean energy investment. This is, a, is hugely going to impact supply chains specifically. The Japan's Green Transformation Program, another specific country initiative that they have very publicly stated they want to transform their economy uh, away from fossil fuels. The European Union's Innovation Council, they have a $10 billion fund that is agnostic to industry, but looks at uh, investing in breakthrough technologies in Europe. And recently the United States, they just uh, launched their tech hub program and they funded 31 hubs across eight key areas. And each of these key areas are going to change the way that supply chains react within those industries. So switching now to academia, uh, I'll just quickly, just one slide on academia here. Uh, they have really two impacts on supply chain innovation. There are research institutions who are researching supply chain technologies, and that is obviously you know, last mile delivery and um, location tracking and blockchain technologies. All of those things have an, an a direct impact on supply chain processes and models. And then indirectly, right, all, all of the, in, the institutions that are researching new chemicals, new drugs, new pharmaceuticals, all of those innovations have supply chain implications because it will change the way that supply chains have to react. The uh, genetic, um, genetic drugs, for example, there are very, very strict cold chain requirements to be able to deliver a, a personalized genetic treatment from creation to the patient. And so that is going to create all new technologies around that so that the supply chains can support that. Uh, shifting now to one of my favorite spaces, um, I, I have been in the entrepreneurial community as well as my consulting work. Uh, have done startups myself and have advised startups. And so I really love to incorporate startups into a lot of the, the conversation, especially when innovation is involved. And so a startup is a company that is prioritizing growth over profitability. And their aim is to disrupt industries and change the world. Supply chain has seen a traumatic um, increase in investment up, up, um, since COVID. So everyone knows what supply chain is now. And the, the venture community and the, the founder community has shifted a lot of their resources into supply chains. And we've seen over 10 billion invested in over 590 deals um, recently. And so I've mapped all of those to the right, just so you can get a quick idea of, well, what industries does, do these technologies actually impact? And so using Crunchbase as my data source, here, here is how those companies kind of fall out across the top 20 industries that they impact. Uh, so logistics, and, and this is not mutually exclusive, like one company could be you know, a manufacturing company that is also a logistics company, but so it's how they've tagged themselves and described themselves. But it's interesting to see, you know, food and beverage has a lot of uh, innovation and in how we're delivering, how we're 
how we're doing last mile delivery, how we're doing automated food and beverage services. Um, so you can see some of those trends in the startup activity. And so as promised, uh, one startup, we, uh, according to the poll, AI-driven deci AI decisions via advanced analytics. So I did want to show an example of one company doing that. So I'm going to switch to share screen. Awesome. So this is uh, Laws of Motion. This is a company who is optimizing supply chains and preventing the return of um, product that doesn't fit. So most people now will order something on Amazon or your e-commerce website, and they'll order three different sizes, keep the one that fits, and then return the other two. And so this is a massive drain on, on logistics resources, carbon footprint, you know, backhaul requirements, all of those things are impacted by this. And so Laws of Motion is an application where they have a body scan and they then have a plugin in your browser and you can actually go to like uh, a, a retail e-commerce site, hit the plugin for Laws of Motion and it will feed you all of the sizes that specifically fit your body type and um, the like the, the trims, the size, all of those things. So you know, hey, this is the one that's going to fit me. I'm just going to buy this one. It has massive, massive implications on revolutionizing the retail e-commerce uh, for, for clothing. So going back to, so back into the presentation, uh, I, we do have examples of each of the technologies. Uh, so those are there if, if you're if you're watching later and you see those flip by, you can go take a take a click and, and read more about each of those companies. So shifting to established enterprises, there's there's really two ways for an established enterprise to innovate. It's create innovations and bring external innovations into the enterprise. And, and creating innovations, right, you, your advantage there, you own the intellectual property yourself and you're also focused on the exact problem that you wanna solve. Uh, Saffron, a French aerospace and defense company is a prime example of that in Europe. And they're listed as a top innovation company in France. Bring external innovations in, right? This is market scanning. You're going out there, you're seeing what's happening in, in the industry maybe adjacent industries that impact your industry, and you're able to shift the risks. So you're, you are looking at innovations that, you know, maybe you don't wanna do the very early stage, but you wanna see some market traction before you adopt it. And so you're able to shift, shift some development risk basically to the venture community and to these founders. And then you could bring that into your organization when you're ready. You're also able to fill gaps in innovation capabilities. Maybe you, you need an innovation that you don't have the capability to do that in-house. So you go external to do that. Uh, sticking with the aerospace and defense industry, BAE is an awesome example of this. They have a very robust uh, tech scouting program and they hire tech scouts and they're, they're integrated with uh, several accelerator organizations in order to get a, get a pulse for what the, the startup community is doing. As we sum up each of the four different sources of innovation, they each have their own unique advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and you can see them here, but I really want to transition into how do you as an organization take advantage? <laughs> how do you build your innovation program so that you can take advantage of all of these and limit the disadvantages from each? And so innovation clusters and getting in, inserted into an innovation cluster is one way to do that. So there are two different clusters, geographic clusters and conceptual clusters. A geographic cluster is when the four sources of innovation are co-located in the same geography, there's a positive feedback that makes this just like a really, really strong ecosystem to create innovations. And then there are conceptual clusters, which is, you know, there, there is no requirement to be geographically located, but it is, it is an idea that brings everyone together to create value and to, and to innovate. So how does a geographic cluster get started? Um, you can see here, it's, it, it is a little bit of a flywheel. 
the, the first push of the flywheel is, is um, very, very determining, determinant on, on the geography itself. But once it gets going, you have the four institutions, the four sources, they create innovations. Some of those innovators become startup founders. Those founders raise money and it tracks more venture capital organizations. That money goes to scaling a company. And then those companies end up spinning out additional technology, spinning out additional startups. And you have this virtuous loop where you have this very strong geographic area that has a lot of rich innovation happening. So what does that look like for supply chain management? Here we have uh, those, those same companies that I talked about, the 509. Here, here they are uh, graphed geographically according to where their headquarter locations are. And you'll see very obvious clusters that, that make a lot of sense. Singapore, uh, London, New York, all of these areas are huge, huge financial areas, but also major shipping. Um, there's a lot of shipping that goes through these areas. And so you see a lot of logistics and a lot of supply chain activity going on in these areas. Uh, so how does a company take advantage of like, okay, we've identified some clusters. What do we do with that? Um, one, one good example is uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands is one of the top 10 busiest industry ports in the world. And so if you're a shipper or you're a port operator, you go and you find that cluster and you get involved. And, and Port Excel is kind of the quintessential startup accelerator in the shipping industry. And it was born out of this ecosystem within the Netherlands. And so that is a prime example of uh, using this kind of analysis and then going and building a relationship, and being close to where the innovation happens. So quick quiz for everyone, if we wanna bring up the next poll. Uh, Shell is, Surprised when I was doing the research, now a British oil company. Uh, let's say you're Shell, a British oil company, and you want to stand up an innovation center uh, based on a geographic cluster. If you were Shell in the oil and gas industry, where would you stand up your innovation center? All right, I, so as keep keep voting, I'll keep talking, but Houston is the logical answer as the US industry is, is clustered around Houston for oil and gas. But I kind of asked a trick question. So what is the objective of Shell's innovation department? Is that answer has to be, you have to answer that question first before you understand where you should look to kind of like involve yourself. So Shell's TechWorks is located in Boston, Massachusetts. And the, the objective of Shell TechWorks is to look at other outside of oil and gas problems and bring those into Shell, right? Uh, fossil fuels is going away. Clean energy is coming in. Boston has a lot of clean energy startups. New England has uh, wind power being developed off the shores. And they're also um, very interested in robotics solutions to you know, monitor piping, monitor all of the energy infrastructure, conduct repairs. And so Boston is, has a very high tech scene. And so their Shell TechWorks is located in Boston and their innovation focus is on those ancillary features that are going to expand their business model. Shifting quickly to conceptual clusters. Uh, here's three, just to give examples, a lot of these often are, are driven by and motivated by a cause or a government policy. The Remade Institute is something that a lot of manufacturing industry players are part of, and it is uh, going towards the circular economy. There's the Automotive Anti-Counterfeiting Council, a cluster of North American automators, auto, automakers, where uh, it's, it's not obvious, but auto parts are massively counterfeited brake parts, electronic parts, and it is a, an industry problem. And there is a cluster that is, um, has been created that's focused on that problem. And then there are specific activities. Forum Oceana 
another good example of a, a port Portuguese organization, over 150 members across sectors that all come together to innovate and protect the sea economy. So what is, so innovation happens uh, all throughout the industry through different sources and, and, and an enterprise has to be ready to integrate innovations and create innovations. So the supply chain's role, uh, really two big things. If you want your supply chain to innovate, <laughs> create innovations is obviously one of the roles that you want them to do. But as a company, you, you, we've seen you know, at the beginning of the presentation, innovation is super important. And so you also have to have a supply chain organization that can help with your innovation objectives. And that means maybe there's a, a group within supply chain or certain situations within procurement that aren't incentivized via the normal means, which, you know, long drawn out contracting processes, uh, negotiations over price. A lot of these things are things that, you know, will kill a startup or turn a startup away because they're just not interested in bureaucracy or um, you know very long sales cycles. And so when you look at having a very robust innovation capability, you should also support that with appropriate supply chain functional design. And so agility and flexibility are two of those that are key when you go back to those design characteristics that you should emphasize when you have a couple of analysts or a whole team, depending on what your priority is for innovation that are working specifically on, okay, we're gonna do something we haven't done before. These folks are really good at it and they're not incentivized the same way that the normal procurement organization is incentivized. And so those are things that um, the enterprise needs to look at holistically in order to create a mechanism to have really good and efficient innovation within the organization. And so within that, what industries do we see supply chain innovation needs? This is uh, according to statista.com, R&D spend per employee in the US across some of the, the top 10 industries. So pharmaceuticals spend a ton of money on R&D per employee, all the way down to like electrical equipment, not so much. And so as a student, when you're, when you're looking at this, if you're super interested in being in a dynamic environment, this is kind of a, a, an indicator where you should go kind of look for a job or be prepared to, if you're entering the pharmaceutical supply chain industry, it's gonna be dynamic. There's a lot of change, there's a lot of R&D, there's a lot of regulation, but also like semiconductors, all of these on the left, expect innovation type supply chains and all of these industries on the right, maybe there's a little, they're a little more traditional with efficiency focused. So how do we prepare students to actually enter those uh, industries? So here we have um, you know, students as the change makers. The students in class today are going to be the ones that are integrating these innovations or creating these innovations as founders tomorrow. And so as professors, we look at change management, problem solving, intellectual curiosity, and big picture and systems thinking as critical skills and traits for students to have when they leave and enter the workforce. Uh, what, I, what I try to do throughout the course by reflecting back on the big picture of industry dynamics and competitive advantage is really build that last bullet point and set the students up for success. So I, I did wanna give a, a more detailed case study and we do have a PDF for you to download that's uh, way more detailed. It has uh, guided questions for students. You could use this next week in your class if you want to, but Mercury uh, is a, a third party logistics company and they have recently implemented real-time tracking for biological agent shipping. The uh, 3PL industry is super fragmented, right? That you can, I could own a pickup truck today and tomorrow I could be competing for deliveries. And so there's a very small barrier to entry to get into this industry. In fact, it's so fragmented that the top player in the US, CH Robinson, only owns 6% of the market share of, of all of the the three PLs and the shipping activity within the US. So mercury transports biological agents. And so when you look at what is the environment you play in, they have narrowed that industry to a very niche place. So their competitive decision here is who do I wanna serve and how do I stand out? So you, you, you um, are only serving labs and hospitals now at this point. And so now you have a very small competitive set 
And now in order to stand out in that competitive set, a decision that they have made is to implement 5G sensor trackers and monitor their packages for every delivery. And that is a, a differentiator to attract customers because of the quality of their service. And in order to do that, their supply chain has to be designed specifically to be able to integrate that technology. And when we look at that holistically across the framework, we can see you know, there is a high threat of new entrants in a fragmented industry. Since there are a lot of players, the, the um, customers have a lot of buying power. So you've narrowed your industry and decided on you know, a very niche set of customers to serve. And to ensure that they choose you with their buying power, you have increased your quality above what the requirements of the, of the regulation state. So you can attract those customers. And then in order to um, deliver on that promise, you've increased control, quality, and reliability through these trackers. And so, so that's some, some of the ways that you can apply the framework to really dig into, should you make this decision, should you invest in this technology or not? And so with that, I want to, I want to wrap up the conversation, uh, leave the academic case and transition to a real conversation and would love to see if Manuel is there, if she would join me on stage. Hi, can you all hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, good to be here. Yes, thank you so much. How are you doing today? Yeah, doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Good, so we're, we're talking about innovation, we're talking about supply chain management and you know, you were one of the first people that came to mind that is combining disrupting the supply chain, specifically in the beverage industry for sustainability, but also, so it's like supply chain, it's innovation. And there was no one else that, that I thought of that I should have this conversation with to really highlight some of these attributes that I had just discussed. Uh, so I'd love, you know, give, give you a minute to introduce yourself and Kadea to the group here. Yeah, perfect. So I am Manuela Zonensan, good to see you all. I'm the CEO and founder of Kadea. Kadea has designed a bottling plant that is the size of a vending machine. Like a vending machine, we vend you beverages conveniently. Unlike a vending machine, you return the bottle to any station in the network. And then our patented station itself washes, sanitizes, inspects, and refills the bottle. Um, and I don't know if I can, uh, yes, I would love to um, share my screen for a quick second, if that's okay, um, just so you all can see what that station actually looks like. Uh, I think that's coming up. Perfect. Um, so you can see here, it's a little bit bigger than a traditional vending machine. You go up to it, you either scan a QR code or a credit card or, you know, use near field like your Apple Pay, choose your beverage. We're carrying known products across the spectrum from the Cokes and Pepsis of the world to really local brands. And then as you can see, there's a stainless steel bottle. I have it here in front of me as well. Drops down, gets filled on demand. So kind of like a soda fountain. You enjoy your beverage. When you're done, you return it to the other side there. Um, and then the station, as I mentioned, itself washes, sanitizes, inspects, and refills the bottle. So you can think of the vending machine basically combining a vending machine with a dishwasher and a soda fountain into a 10 and a half square foot box. Um, so that's the machine. Um, I think there's a lot of other questions that um, Nate, you were going to dig into. And so I'll leave it at that for now. I think more detail will come out as we keep going. Very cool. Yeah, it's awesome seeing your progress. And I've been following you for a couple of years now. And so it's awesome to see this develop. Um, so I, I do want to follow the framework that we've just discussed. And so starting with the environment that you sit in, how do you define the industry that you're competing in? And who do you see as your competitors and your threats for differentiation, all, all of those things that we talked about? So in the beginning, I was really focused on sustainability. The motivation for building Kadea was I hate single use packaging of all types. 
And in particular, I hate single use plastic water bottles. And so that became my obsession. And uh, about a year into doing a ton of customer discovery, basically interviews to understand how they thought about water bottles, I realized that sustainability, at least in the United States and most of the world, is still very low in terms of priorities for consumers. And I was lucky enough to stumble across a different opportunity, which is industrial workplaces. So um, I'll go from kind of the macro industry that we think we're competing in down to the very micro. So as you mentioned, we're in the beverage space and specifically I'll say we're in beverage packaging. We're trying to divorce the product that's inside of a bottled beverage, you know, like you have your Coke that comes in a 16.9 ounce bottle. What you're buying is not, you don't, you, you want the container and it's a temporary vehicle, but you really want what's inside the bottle, right? The job to be done, this kind of like a, a nice little framework from Clayton Christensen, the job to be done is you want to drink that beverage. You don't really care about the package. Um, and so today is in the beverage packaging industry and I'm divorcing the product inside from the packaging. And then I'd say going a little bit more micro, what are we doing? We're in the hydration space and that necessarily then brings us to the health space. Packaging, since we're in a supply chain conversation, right, is a way to transport the product inside from point A to B to C, et cetera. So we are very much as well in the beverage transportation space, although I'm changing the framework of how that beverage moves from point A to B to C to get to the industry, to get to the final consumer. Um, and our go to market focus is these industrial environments. So the solution I'm delivering is a logistics solution that solves the logistics headache of transporting packaged beverages all over the world and ultimately trying to get a monster energy or a bottle of water into the hands of a construction worker. So we're both in the beverage packaging industry and in the beverage distribution industry. Very cool. Um... I love that focus on the industrial workplace and you know it completely analogous to what we just talked about with you know mercury 3pl is like no we're going to choose a very sub specific subset so that we know we can create a competitive advantage yep. um, the logistics piece is super interesting what who who are you selling to and it's interesting to think about you know if the if the if you're replacing logistics, are the logistics folks a direct com competitor or are you competing with the brand? Right. So I think at the heart of, it's a very good question. At the heart of the question is, um, and I don't, I don't mean to jump around too much, but um, Kadea's innovation, especially from a supply chain perspective, is that we're taking we're shrinking down the entire beverage supply chain at to the point of use. Yeah. And so, you know, if we look at the station, um, what that does is, well, let's think about today's beverage supply chain uh, and I'll generalize here, right? But let's say you're getting a plastic bottle of Coca-Cola. First that petroleum needs to be sourced and then it has to be refined and pelletized into a physical plastic product. And then that pel those pellets get shaped and blown into a bottle. And then those bottles get filled. And these are all happening at different points on the supply chain. And then they get filled and capped. And then they get put on a bunch of trucks and probably go to a fulfillment center. And then from a, a major regional fulfillment center to a distribution center. Um, and there's a bottler that happens somewhere along that way. In Chicago, it's Reyes, Coca-Cola bottling. And then they're distributing on trucks. And then eventually that those bottles end up in a Walmart or a Costco or in some sort of warehouse for a Compass Group uh, or Sodexo and Aramark. 
and they put them on the back of trucks and they take them to a factory and load up a bunch of vending machines. Multiple steps, very labor intensive, time intensive, costly. Kadea says, wait a second, we've got tap water. That is a great infrastructure. Why are we transporting these bottles and these beverages everywhere? Let's leverage the water infrastructure that already exists, which is the number one ingredient in your packaged beverage, and let's bottle it where the consumer is going to enjoy it. And then let's wash and sanitize and inspect that bottle at that same location so it can be repackaged. That's awesome. And, and so to your question, right, you could say, well, Manuela, you're going to compete against some very powerful incumbents. And so a big part of what I spend my time thinking about is how do I minimize competitive forces? So I'm not going up against Coca-Cola, Pepsi, et cetera. I'm not going up against Reyes bottling and other huge bottlers around the globe. I don't want to go against um, the uh, filtration technology companies. I will, if I'm successful, compete against petroleum and plastic companies. And I think that they should go out of business. So I'm okay with that. But everybody else, I want them to be my friends. And I want them to either be my customers, my collaborators. I want to be their customer. I want us to work together. And I want them to benefit from my success. And so that's one of the main reasons why we do not do our own beverages right now. We're not trying to be a beverage company. So we are carrying known products. We're carrying Coke, Pepsi, et cetera. And that's easy because there's a thing called a bag and box. When you go to a McDonald's and you fill up a, a cup at a soda fountain, it's a little bag in a box sitting in the back there with a little plastic tube of IV, kind of IV that dispenses a tiny amount of Coca-Cola concentrate along with carbonated water into your cup. And it mixes it on demand. That's exactly what we're doing. So we're not asking Coke and Pepsi to change any of their technology and methods. So we don't want to compete. And actually we do it at a third of the cost of a packaged beverage. So we can say, hey, Coke and Pepsi, we can save you money. And we get you better consumer data and better engagement with those consumers. And now we can net out your carbon footprint as well as the waste that everyone's complaining about. Or when we talk about those, uh, the bottling companies, my vision is that I, over time as we scale, right now we're only going to place 20 units this year. I'm not in a position to try to sell to a big bottler, but when we get to that scale, I want Reyes to buy my stations. And instead of having a million square foot bottling plant on the outskirts of Chicago that has to get trucked, the product gets trucked across Chicagoland, which is where we're headquartered, why not just have 10,000 of my stations that can do the exact same volume? And let's take your labor pool and instead of them doing low level work of loading pallets of bottles in the back of a truck and driving them around town, and then stocking vending machines, let's train them up to do some higher value technical work to support the Kadea network of stations. So I'm really trying to say to Ray is I'm gonna save you money. I'm gonna save you time. You're gonna have a great sustainability story. You're gonna have better quality data and you can put your workforce to work doing work that they actually wanna be doing where they can generate good living wages. So it's trying to be a win-win-win across the value chain as much as possible. Very cool, that sounds sounds awesome. Uh, I know we're getting close to time, so I just wanna ask one more question so we can leave a little bit of time for Q&A at the end here. Um, pivoting a little bit to your journey and you know this course and this video is geared towards students and we want to give students some advice on how do you enter a disruptive supply chain? How do you succeed in a disruptive supply chain? And so what are some of the things that have enabled you as a founder to be able to get to where you are? I think the educational world is increasingly moving to be oriented toward getting jobs 
And I think that that is valuable. I think vocational training is awesome and important and underfunded at the moment in the United States, but that is where people are moving, especially this focus on STEM, where, you know, it's all about learning marketable skills. And I agree that that is valuable. I think why I've been able to succeed is because I had a broad based, more liberal arts education that stressed interdisciplinary understanding. And the what I would say in college is I learned how to learn. And that's one of my strengths. I can get to, if you think about kind of 80-20 model, it, I can get to a B average understanding of any topic probably faster than anyone I know. And that as a CEO is really what I need. I don't need to do that final 20% because there are people who are experts and have that really deep knowledge. But what makes me powerful as a CEO is that every three months as my job requirements change, I ramp up very quickly and I can identify then the right talent to come in and supplement my skills for that final 20% of knowledge. And so I can't speak to what students today need, but I will tell you my strength comes from an educational background that is much more interdisciplinary about learning how to learn learning how to consume information and identify the right types of information quickly, identify good people to work with and building good people skills around that. And um, and I also do have a strong math and science foundation as part of that. I'm not saying I only studied, you know, literature, I, uh, strong economic backgrounds, strong math background, strong scientific background, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. And I think that's very powerful for the role that I'm in. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been an awesome conversation. I uh, appreciate everyone else for being here. Paul, do you want to come on stage and, and wrap things up for us? Yes. Uh, thank you, Nate. Uh, thank you, Manuela. That was awesome to hear what you're doing uh, in academia and in the real world. We loved it. Um, we do have a question here and I want to invite anyone who has questions to go ahead and enter them in the chat right now. Um, Manuela, this question was for you and it was Kelly and she's wondering um, how to find high-tech solutions to a manufacture to manufacture a type of station if using for eco-friendly cleaning products or integrating technology with being unsure of the best route if trying to integrate zero waste initiatives. Hey, Any Kelly. Good to, yeah, good to see you again. Good to reconnect. Um, I, I have some uh, eco-friendly cleaning product type stations that I know of. So maybe uh, the short answer would be feel free to reach out to me again. On, um, I know we're connected on LinkedIn and I can give you a list of some of those. Uh, I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel um, in that case. Um, and I think this gets a little bit to what um, we were hearing a little bit earlier from, from Nate about how do you think about uh, kind of competitive advantages? I think um, you don't need to invent reinvent the wheel. Uh, it could be a nice cash flow business, but I don't I don't think you'll own the IP and I don't think it would be kind of like venture backable or venture returns type business. But it could be a very like like any vending machine is a good cash flow type business. So that's how I would think about the cleaning product space. I haven't come across any any company with a cleaning products kiosk that really has the competitive advantages that Nate was talking about. Great, thank you. Um, Nate, we had a question. Uh, you you talked about the AI-driven innovation example and you used um, Zara for that. Uh, did you have any other examples in relation to that? Yeah, so there's so many things that are happening in artificial intelligence right now. And actually, if, if, <clears throat> if, if we were to share a screen, um, there's automation of bill of material ordering there's you know automation of, of um, supplier dashboards and scoring. There's automation of tracking. 
uh, AI has blown up and it is impacting all of like, all of the business functions and supply chain is, is very much amenable to a lot of the solutions that AI provides, forecasting, um, increasing predictability. When you look at those, those, those design characteristics, you can almost apply an AI solution to, to any one of those. Great. Well, Nate, before we finish up today, I want to give you a minute to talk about your upcoming courseware, um, Advanced Supply Chain Strategic Concepts and Case Studies. Um, and while he's doing that, I want to encourage everyone to click on the link that's on your page right now and use it to request a demo of this courseware. Our course consultants, they'd love to walk you through this courseware and answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Just just to highlight, you know, put, putting putting the course together has been a, a fantastic experience for me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've got over 120 real world examples, so I bring industry into the classroom. So it's not hypothetical. It's founded on what's really happening. And these are examples across over over 20 countries and over 33 industries. So I try to get a good representation globally, as well as uh, a good distribution of any industry a student is, is likely to, to graduate and go out and, and participate in. Great. Okay, it looks like we had one other question from Thomas um, regarding Kadea's stations from the consumer factory worker. How does the transaction work? What is the value proposition from the consumer's perspective and how are the prices relative to traditional soda vending machines? Hi, Thomas, thanks for your question. Hugely important and a big part of where I spend my time and my team's time. Um, I just uploaded into the handouts our uh, introductory slides that we send uh, to the industrial uh, kind of factory worker um, use case that you mentioned. So you can read through that um, and that'll answer in more detail. Uh, but uh, at a high level, briefly, I'll say the transaction is meant to emulate a traditional vending machine. You scan a work badge, a QR code. If you want to, if you usually in these environments, you have like a badge with like a debit card on it, like prepaid. So you can use that on our system. Choose your beverage, get dispensed. And then when you're done, drop the bottle off. Um, and the value proposition from that individual consumer is, um, so we are, I guess this comes to the price question. Um, we are cost competitive. We're at parity to single use. So you can get the exact, you can pay the exact same price. Um, we've toyed with going cheaper. We haven't found the need to go there yet. Um, and so for the end consumer, really, we're just saying, we're just as good as single use in terms of convenience and you can get the same product, but there's a digital component. This is the IoT piece of what we were doing that I didn't get into, but it generates data that helps the, the user to understand their hydration levels and they can set goals and they can integrate it to their Fitbit or other health tracking tools. So we're building the, think of it as step trackers for water, which doesn't exist today. And if you're in an industrial work site, you really want to make sure that you're hydrated. Hydration, dehydration is actually the number one cause of injury and death. Um, in industrial work sites in the United States. So these people really think about making sure that they're staying well hydrated and we're building a digital tool that costs them no money to enable them to uh, monitor that and then preempt dehydration in the future. So you're saying we're going to be monitoring our steps and our water intake in the future. <laughs> yeah, we, we, monitor, we monitor steps. We don't monitor water, which is are the most critical resource for human survival. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Nate, tell us, um, I know that your upcoming courseware is filled with case studies. Tell us a little bit about the case studies that are in there, how many, some of the topics that you cover. Yeah, so every chapter ends with a case study. And so we'll have um, 12 case studies. The first two chapters are introductory, so we don't jump into case studies yet. And uh, each one is relevant to the chapter. So it's manufacturing, it's network design, it's innovation, um, risk management, global supply chains. Uh, and every single one goes through this, the story 
and then ends with the analysis across the framework. And so as a, as a professor, what we're doing here is we're really re-emphasizing and reiterate that, reiterating that same framework across understand your industry, create a competitive advantage, design your supply chain. And so what we're doing is um, doing something over and over again for repetition so that when students leave, you know, two years from now, you want to know like, hey, what did you learn in that class? We really um, hammer home that concept over and over again so that they have something that really digs deep into their, you know, the back side of their brain that they're going to be able to use, um, you know, day one when they hit the ground in their new company, they're going to be able to be like, okay, well, why are we doing this? Let me like ask the right questions, understand why I'm sitting here and what my role means. And so that, that's what we do with the case studies and throughout the, case, throughout the course. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nate and Manuela, for joining us today. And for all of you who are watching, if you enjoyed today's event, be sure to check out our upcoming events and webinars. Our next event is for our marketing and communications audience, and it's called Influencers, YouTube SEO, and Emerging Digital Trends. What do your students need to know? So we're constantly adding more events to our calendar, so make sure and check those out. Thanks again once more to Nate and Manuela for making today's webinar such a success. And thank you to each one of you for joining us. We appreciate your continued support. We want you to have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend, and remember to stay current with Stukent. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks.